Well, Patreon, thank you for your support and welcome to this week's Crowdcast. I am very excited to present to you my friend, narrative director of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Darby McDevitt, who comes to us from uh, the Montreal uh, studios of Ubisoft. Uh, so I have questions that were submitted uh, on Patreon by Patreon supporters and pre-vetted by Ubisoft. So I'll ask those, um, you know, depending on uh, time and, and circumstances, we might be able to take some minor follow-up things, but mostly I'm going to have to kind of stick to almost a sort of scripted list of questions. But uh, they were submitted by Patreon supporters like you. Um, another question we had was from Talon Spencer who asked, is there a book of all the tattoos? I love trying to translate the inscriptions on the few that I have found. Um, th I don't think there is. There might be, and I have it at my desk. I should have brought it. Um, uh, we do have a book of the art of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and it has all the concept art that went into the making of this game. We have a very talented art team. Uh, Raphael Lacoste is the art director. He actually was the art director on the very first Assassin's Creed game. He set the kind of the tone of this whole universe. Um, he moved on to other things like doing some films and things um, after Assassin's Creed 1, but he came back for Assassin's Creed Revelations, Black Flag, Origins, um, so Pirates, Classical Egypt, and then this game. Um, he brings together a lot of talent, um, concept artists from all over. And they spend, they get to spend the first year and a half of three year project just painting, just, hey, what should this world look like? What should the color palette be? Uh, we go on a trip um, and then we take lots of photographs and then he comes back and um, this is a very long winded answer to say that there's an art of Assassin's Creed Valhalla book. It may contain some of the tattoo designs. Um, if it does not, I can actually poke our presentation director um, and our art director and presentation guys, Nick Rivard, he, you know, he came up with all the menus and all the, just the, 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 the look and feel of the games um, outside the art, uh, the, the, you know, environmental art, you know, so what the menus look like, what uh, the text looks like, you know, he chose the pairings of the text, these serif fonts with these sans serif fonts, etc. He, I think he, his team was in charge of a lot of the uh, tattoos. So I could ask him and tell and kind of tell him that there are people out there hungering for high res versions of those. Um, I don't think it would be a problem to start slapping a bomb them online somewhere and we, we often put very high res stuff on uh, about the costumes so that cosplayers can recreate our costumes you know for like uh, comic book conventions and stuff like that but um, it would be maybe worth it to also do that for the the tattoos so I can ask we have a question from uh, the winter wolf who has uh, I picked up this game on release and as I started playing I was thinking how great it would be uh, if they had Jackson Crawford working them in this thank you uh, needless to say, I was very happy to see your interview talking about your involvement. Thanks for adding some authenticity to this fun Viking fantasy. My question is, it sounds like Old Norse is spoken by the NPCs in the game. How much of this is Old Norse versus Modern Icelandic? Also, did you use Modern Icelandic as a base to construct the conversational dialogue in Old Norse? And I'll meet. Yes, that is a good question. And I um, I tried to get in contact with the, uh, the guy uh, that... Uh, that was responsible. Um, so even though I'm the narrative director, we actually have a whole other team of audio designers who handle all the ambient crowd life. Um, and a guy named Nick, Nick Grimwood, who's been writing our, our NPC conversations since Assassin's Creed two. So since 2009, every single city, um, and every single population of every country has been made by the Montreal studio. He has put all the words in their mouth, um, for ancient Egyptian, uh, the, the game in, in well, Cleopatra's Egypt, he actually had to, he constructed a kind of fake uh, Egyptian because um, it would just been too much of a task to recreate um, and get all the actors to, to learn this and to create full sentences in it. For this game, I'm actually not sure what he did. I know he's very, very um, keen to do a lot of research, but he may have used modern Icelandic. I think I saw some people online um, uh, saying that they could just perfectly understand it. So uh, I th it sounds like it might have been mo modern Icelandic. Um, and I know that during the course of the project, when we were, it's always when we cast these games, we always want to be as authentic as possible. Um, and then those plans fall apart immediately when you are trying to find like 
oh, what are, we need only Icelandic actors because that's the you know the closest to the language, even though the accent would have been different. That's the closest to the language. But as soon as you start seeing actors, you know your favorite actor for this part is actually a, a Danish you know citizen. So okay, let's yeah, they're so great. Let's get them and. So you know, it's very weird when like Eivor, both Magnus and uh, Cecilia, the two uh, sides of this personality, when both of them are Danish actors, and um, they say like, "Oh, I'm Norse, and I'm from Norway," and like uh, all the people in in the Nordic countries kind of turn their heads. Um, so I will have to get back to you on that, but I maybe. Maybe you can link some videos of crowds talking to just Jackson. <laughs> he can just have a listen, uh, and and they can tell you. But I I, th I would assume that it would be modern Icelandic for the most part, because then we could just go grab a bunch of Icelandic actors and they could just knock it out of the park. Yeah, that's what I would expect. Um, but yeah, people forget how many, just the, the thousands of people that work on different aspects of a game. Yeah. Um, yeah. I certainly wasn't aware of that before I was connected to this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sal Perniciaro asks, um, in terms of the metaphysics of the game, uh, what was the reasoning of the developers to alter some of the original stories from Norse myth, although they mostly rang true? For example, the story of the wall builder was altered quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll mute. This is a, this is a great question. Cause um, so for anyone who knows Assassin's Creed, um, and has been following our franchise. We we play fast and loose with mythology because in the Assassin's Creed mythos, um, all the ancient pagan gods are actually were actually real people who lived seventy five thousand years ago. And the so the Greek you know pantheon, the Roman pantheon, the Norse pantheon, you know all these all these old pagan uh, religions we say that they are a first civilization called the Isu who lived 75,000 years ago and were in fact the creators of humanity uh, that we were created as a slave race for them and as we it's kind of a blade runner story as we you know spread throughout uh, their society some Isu started saying hey maybe you know they're living creatures maybe they should have be afforded the same rights that we have and there was a big war over that human Isu war some Isu were on the side of the humans many were not and then there was this huge catastrophe called the, the Toba catastrophe which was I think in real life it was a gigantic volcanic event that covered the earth in ash and led to the decimation of the earth's population there was only about 10,000 um, uh, uh, individual humans left. Uh, this is a real event and we used it for our own purposes. So we say that the Isu died out then and that the humans took over and over time the stories of the Isu and their very real lives through some giant game of historical telephone turned into the myths of, uh, of the Norse and the Greeks and etc. So the reason we alter um, some of the myths is because we are we actually have a history of what happened with um, uh, our characters, our Isu characters, and it turns out that this this uh, Toba catastrophe fits very nicely in with the idea of Ragnarok, for instance. But we've already been doing Assassin's Creed for twelve years, so there's a lot of little story details that already exist. So we tweak and we change. Um, the Norse myths to fit into some of our own um, existing mythos. So, for instance, the, there's the mead of poetry story that we turn into. Um, it's not a mead that that gives you the gift of poetry. It's actually a mead that um, it prolongs your life um, and sends your huger. We, we had to find a, a word to to indicate spirit or soul. Now, there's not really one in Old Norse, I guess, but we use Huger because um, it sounded it's it's fun to say Huger, and uh, so if you play the Jotunheim arc, you'll see that we've significantly altered the meat of poetry story, and it doesn't have the 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 uh, the uh, the end part where uh, you know the the bad poet where the bad poets come from. <laughs> we just got rid of that part, a little too. Uh, uh, unseemly for our audience maybe but um so we, so we did the same for the builder we needed a way to have the builder relate to this um higher level uh story that we were telling underneath so one fun thing is all the things you see in the 
the mythological layer in our game are actually an allegory for what actually happened in the first Civ world. And if you, um, there's a very final moment where when uh, Odin and all his, uh, the Aesir and some Vanir get the mead, they sit around a table and they drink it. And you see it in a kind of an Old Norse with Old Norse wrappings. If you do this other element of our game, what we call the Animus Anomalies, you will actually see that scene play a second time, but with all the Old Norse stripped off and the complete like science fiction layer put on. So it's if you play them side by side, they run almost parallel, and it's all the same dialogue and it's all the same you know actions. But one of them is the real story, and one of them is the Norse. The Norse uh, has the old Norse paint job or the, the mythological paint job, if you will. So that's why we change the myths, um, and and, uh, and we'll probably continue to do so as we develop our sort of first Civ Isu storyline. That's that's really cool. And by the way, the the art and the Jotunheimer arc is some of my favorite in the whole game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So we have a question from uh, Hayden Fox. Uh, loving the game, I'd argue the greatest in the series. I know uh, your sponsor, uh, my sponsor, uh, Crawford, is Grimfrost, and they made a post before the game released about how people would end up naming their kids Avor off the character from the game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they mentioned that uh, it was unfortunate that Ubisoft didn't do more research into the name as Avor is a feminine name. Right, right. All right. From your videos, it sounds like there would be a masculine version of the name as well, which would be Avar. So, what made Ubisoft go with that specific name? Okay, okay so. So. Nah, <laughs> so, for those of you who haven't played the game, you might want to turn your volume down right now because we're a little ways out of... Uh, I'm not going to fully spoil it, but I'm going to explain why. Um, but right now, turn your volume down if you don't want it spoiled. And I will raise my fist like this when you can turn it back up. So in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, the, the uh, character Eivor is a female. Um, the historical character is a female. So we did do our research, and Jackson helped us with that. We picked Eivor specifically because it means something like infinite defender or forever defender, which was very much fit the theme of our game, especially the idea of forever or infinite. Um, but Eivor is a female in our story. However, through the magic of Assassin's Creed science fiction and craziness, because uh, for those of you who don't know, um, and if I guess... If you're not listening if you don't know or anyway <laughs> you don't want to be spoiled i don't know but um our game is a science fiction series where people uh observe um the ancestral memories in a strand of dna so i could take my dna and go back and relive the life of my father up till i was conceived and my grandfather up till uh, he my father was conceived or my grandmother etc cetera, etc cetera, and going all the way back these memories in our world are, are contained with bazillions of terabytes upon terabytes of information in our DNA. And, you, and the further you go back, the more jagged it gets. But at the beginning of our game, the Animus, which is the device that allows this to happen, picks up not just Eivor female's uh, memory stream, but uh, an, another male, a very strong set of male memories as well. And the Animus is not understanding why these are equally strong. And it turns out that in our game, the female Eivor is actually a reincarnation of one of these uh, Isu from long, long, long time ago. And that Isu was a male. So uh, we didn't make a mistake. Uh, we picked it very, very specifically. We, just, we, we did <laughs> confuse a lot of people uh, because people were like, oh, that's a female name. And outside Scandinavia, Nobody knows the difference, um, but we were aware that, that that some people would pick up on it, but it fully actually fits with the story of our game. And if you want to play as the male in our game, what you're playing as is a, a set of reincarnated memories from a long time ago, a kind of a self-image that this person has. I, I actually, the, the, the easiest way to talk about this is to say it's like Fight Club, where there's Edward Norton and Brad Pitt, also, Fight Club spoilers here. It's been out a long time. But but they are the same person, but two sides of the same personality. But they interact with one another as if they're two different people. We took a similar approach where you can choose to play as one or the other. You can choose to play as the real historic woman, 
or you can choose to play as the identity of this reincarnated Isu. And as you play the game, you'll understand the deep sort of mystery behind why this is. And for those who actually get to the end of the game, put all the pieces together, it's a mystery worth, um, worth discovering. Like most of the fans that have written to me have been really excited about, hey, you guys pulled off this interesting dual protagonist thing in a really interesting way. And even people who don't love it are kind of like, you know, that was clever. Um, so I'm, 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 we didn't just ignore it, right? We, we said, let's make it a part of the story. And it's, the response has been really cool. So Eivor is female, <laughs> at least in the ninth century England. <laughs> Are you going to put your fist up? Oh yeah! To, to show oh yeah! You? yeah. Come on back! Oh, come, so, on back. come on back! <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know we could even. I didn't even know we could talk about the name stuff yet because I was part of that long email chain about naming this yeah. character. Yeah. Um, Hayden Fox had a, a, a follow-up questions. Uh, where did they draw their version, or where did you draw your version of Ivar from? Uh, what historical records uh, Ivar. did you use? Mm -hmm. um, part of it was part of Ivar was just. Um, looking at what had already been done um everyone a, a lot of people on our team had watched the viking show and we and and we i really admire the kind of the, the way they took that character and how, what the actor did with it um and they obviously picked the sort of the brittle bone uh version of ivar but that wasn't i mean we didn't let that stop us but we also just said hey vikings already did that one let's do the one where he's he's got a sort of a particular fighting style he that's why he's called boneless and then a or she even says um all, not because they don't call you that because you're too drunk to plow like you know like as a kind of a derogatory kind of um jab but and then the conception of him i believe one of the first um uh character descriptions we had of him is that he's a fading rock star um uh, vikings the show kind of shows his entire journey we're just showing his last year of life um, so he's already gone to Ireland and lost Ireland, and you know he's already conquered most of what he, um, you know, historically we know him to have done. Um, and then historically, he sort of disappears from the record around seventy three, I think. Um, we extended his life about a year beyond that, um, but we just wanted a guy whose past glories were behind him, and he was feeling a little restless about that. So, if you go through the two territory arcs in our game. He pushes hard, perhaps too hard, to try to get some last taste of glory. Um, it ends up being the second arc with him ends up being one of the most sort of uh, um, pe people like it a lot in our in our game. Uh, they like it a lot for like those the, all the all the reasons that make you angry. <laughs> he he's kind of a, a dick in that uh, territory, but um, so that was our our thinking. Really, the fading rock star, the guy whose best days were behind him, but he's too hyped up to notice that kind of thing um yeah yeah i like the fading rock star analogy yeah, yeah. uh and uh, the last question from hayden fox's post was um can you can oh well this is sort of related to a previous one can the runic tattoos on characters be translated to mean something or are they just for show <laughs> uh sometimes they are sometimes they aren't it depends on the it depend it would probably depend on the artist who um, worked on it. Uh, as I say, like, um, these games are made by like 700 people, um, many studios, many hundreds of people. We did have constant contact with, uh, uh, Dr. Crawford, um, on a lot of things. And he actually translated a lot of things into runes for us. Um, but, um, it was always possible that an, an artist working on some corner on some small thing, like a special effect when like, you know, a Jotnar cast, uh, one of the Jotun cast a, um, a spell or something, or, you know, some flash around a weapon as it swings through the air and there's like runes that fly off of it. Those, some of those might've been missed and someone might've gone and, um, we always encourage people to do their own research, but that can be as harmful as it can be helpful. You know, someone might find a runic translator online, and then they go, "Dig, dig, dig, dig!" Great, that's that's it. Um, in fact, in fact, <laughs> Jackson, uh, after the game was released, a few days, he actually wrote to me and said, "Hey, someone found this old Norse in the game. This is kind of gibberish." And it turned out that one person did, in fact, find something online that was not correct. 
um, and put it in the game thinking it was correct. So, you know, had all the right intentions. Um, was very excited about getting to share. You know, I think it's very exciting for people to to play with these strange letters we don't have anymore, like the the, the you know the D with the. Whoosh. Um, and I think someone just put it in, and so I just like looked it up, and we actually patched it, and we 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 got rid of it in in one of our patches. So these things are possible, but it, it all it always comes out of a place of love. Like somebody gets excited about using runes, and they but they use it incorrectly, and it happens. Um, but a lot of the main stuff, uh, Jackson did help us with it. So um, assume that if it's right, Jackson looked at it. If it's wrong, he had no idea. <laughs> that's that's a very generous way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll take credit for whatever's right. Um, and then this question is going to sound like it's from me, but it's actually posed by Nathan Halverson. Okay. Um, okay. Is Dr. Crawford a character in the game anywhere um, under an alias oh, with the same likes and face? If not, will you please code him in there for the DLC whenever that happens? Yeah. yeah. So we do have a few of our um, employees in this game. Um, there's a f uh, there's a woman, the Lady Elette in in Colchester in Essex. She, you can flight with her. You can do a battle of you know a poetry battle with her. That's actually our one of our brand uh, our marketing uh, um, people, Anouk. Uh, so uh, and I think Jackson knows Anouk. So if you if you flight with her, know that you are flighting with uh, Anouk. Um, and I think there's a few more, but I don't know that we've got Jackson in there. But we must have. We must have like his current, you know, beard and mustache set up. This looks like a very like, you know, a thing we could probably pull off in our game. So maybe, maybe I'll suggest it. Is there an old, uh, old um, Norse or uh, old English Jackson? Is does it come from something? Or Crawford? Or Crawford. Uh, Crawford is old English. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's great that that Anouk is in there. Anouk is great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Martin Conrad asks uh, this very cool opportunity. I'll be buying uh, Assassin's Creed for Hal's a Christmas present, uh, so I'm already pretty hyped. I'd like to know if it's possible to meet some of the Norse gods inside the game, um, since uh, some of the gods seem to have looked monks in human shape in some of the uh, old poems. Yes. yes. So, so again, again, I should do my fist spoiler thing. Um, uh, so starting now, our spoilers. Uh, absolutely. So in our game... Um, we try to treat our game as very grounded when you're in the ninth century in Norway and England and a couple other places. You actually, they go a little ahistorically, but there's a, a trip to Vinland as well. Um, for those of you who know our story, um, the Templars, or called the Order of Ancients in our game, are always a little ahead of the curve when it comes to history. So you heard that people went in 1000 AD, but we know that they actually went in, in uh, eight, uh, <laughs> 876. Um uh, but uh, we try to keep all that very, very grounded. Um, there is, however, um, a secondary story in our game where our character Eivor, she gets a prophecy from a vulva uh, in her um, clan who tells her um, through a series of sort of visions and readings and things that she will betray, that Eivor will betray her brother Sigurd. And this weighs heavy on Eivor for a lot of the game. Um, and uh, when you get to England and you, if you build... Uh, Valka, this is our the Volva. Her name's Valka. If you build her a little hut where she can live, she prepares another brew for you. It says, "Let's go deeper into your visions. I want to take you on a vision quest." And if you drink this, um, you will be transported first to Asgard, and then later you go to Jotunheim, uh, and you will meet a lot of the characters associated with those two places. So uh, there's the opportunity to to meet uh, Thor, Odin, uh, Freya. Uh, Loki, Tyr, um, those are the main characters, and a couple other minor characters like Ivaldi the dwarf and Fenrir. Um, Ivaldi has a funny moment where he goes through the litany of his uh, all the dwarves. <laughs> it's just like you just have to walk away because it's too long. You just oh, okay, bye. <laughs> and uh, and then in uh, Jotunheim, there's uh, characters like Sutunger, uh, Gunnlöder, um, uh, Hirokin. Um, and uh, Angerboda, um, as well as like uh, the Well of Mimir, there's Mimir and things like that. So 
lots of cool people to meet. And we, in almost every story in the myth worlds is taken from the myths themselves, um, modified for our own purposes in some cases. But you know, if you, if you know and love this subject, uh, you'll recognize everything. Uh, we even have, uh, there's a flighting um, in the dream worlds where, uh, where uh, Odin and Thor actually yell at each other across a great chasm with a river beneath it. Uh, <laughs> so to, to pay homage to, to that moment. Um, so absolutely, you have a good time. It's a good many, many hours spent in the company of the gods. I love all those shout outs. Yeah. And, yeah. and how specific they are to real stories in the Eddas. Um, all right. So I see Ryland Bighorn asked, uh, runes during gameplay vary quite a bit. Uh, when characters heal or charge, they emit runes. Uh, during the fight with the builder in Oscar, I guess it's kind of a spoiler, there are several painted runes mm -hmm. that appear made up along with Elder and Younger Futhark, but some are clearly Anglo-Saxon. Uh, wondering how these made their way into Oscar. Yeah. Yeah. I think I kind of answered that in the previous question, but it's just, it's, it's, it's a mix of, of us, uh, or let's say artists and things availing themselves of Dr. Crawford's help and some uh, kind of doing their own research and getting a, a few things wrong. Uh, in the ter in terms of uh, the effects that come off of uh, characters, it's it's there for to, to sort of set a mood and and give you a feeling of you know magic happening or whatever. Um, um, it doesn't actually um, have a strict meaning. I wouldn't suggest pausing your screen and trying to translate uh, the effects flying off of uh, the builder's weapons. Um, but oh, I'm supposed to raise my hand <laughs> because come back. Um, uh, so yeah, so I think, but I answered that. It's it's just uh, some things get overlooked um, on a project this size and, and this long. Well, and I think there's such a thing as as using things kind of decoratively or to set a mood without trying to make it, you know, quote unquote, literally mean something every time. I mean, we do right, that right in in. I guess if you made like a banner for an old North Studies program or something, you might just have like a bunch of runes on your little banner without it meaning something. The runes yeah, just say, yeah. we do Old Norse stuff here, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, Asahilm Obser, I may not be pronouncing that right, asks, uh, what research did you do into Dark Ages Norse combat techniques? Um, I love uh, the way the story is constructed, the open world gameplay, and the skill tree uh, progression. But as a HEMA instructor, um, specializing in Dark Ages Norse combat reconstructed, I was a bit disappointed by the application of the shield. Uh, because the shield uh, is such a uh, major aspect of Dark Ages Viking uh, combat. Yeah, um, we did do a lot of research um, in the beginning. Um, we went to Norway and we spent a day with a bunch of um, fight instructors well, who gave us a big overview and we filmed the whole thing and went through lots of techniques with you know pulling shields away, actually using shields uh, as weapons. Um, talking about shield walls especially all these things we you you begin games uh, a lot of times with um the hope that you can use 100 percent of your research what often happens in games is that you make huge compromises for the just the straight up comfort and quality um and flow of the of the gameplay now i'm not actually a fight designer so um i would suggest um finding some of the there's a guy named alex gilbert uh, he, uh, he's a good guy. He worked on the fight system. He's on Twitter, I think. Um, and he, he could tell you more about this than I do, but I know that just in general, when you're in, in games, you start with all the research and you start to apply it to the actual system you have. Okay, remember, we actually had a combat system already made from Odyssey and we take it and we tweak it as much as we can for our purposes but you, you're not going to remake it from the ground up because that would take years and years and years. And we wanted to get this game out, you know, two years after Odyssey. So you start to make compromises along the way. Um, you also start to, uh, to, to ask yourself, like people will notice there's a lot of um, historically inaccurate um, weapons in our game. One of that is just, uh, we are uh, an animus reconstruction of history. So we often will use the animus, this computer that's recreating these memories to inject fake content. Like you can ride a big wolf in our game. You can have a wolf mount. You can also have like a, a long ship with rainbow sails. <laughs> it's just like there's cosmetic stuff that we, we say on the animus layer, it's just the animus doing it. It's not actually any real. 
um, we blur the lines sometimes because we want to give you the biggest range of combat. So, for instance, flails were not actually used at this time. I don't think they were really ever used in any combat situation apart from a couple attempts in some small eras. But I don't think flails were ever a major um, weapon. Uh, there are also double-handed swords, not a big thing at this time. Um, but we have them. So the Dane axes and the bearded axes, we have lots of those. We actually have a, a lack of one-handed swords, which is which a lot of people have found weird. But in terms of um, feeling, it's very similar to an axe. So I think the fight team just said, we're not going to have both. We're just going to have the axe because we're doing a double sort of set of animations for the same basic weapon. You know, we're not going to do that. Um, I know a lot of, of people are upset about that, but there is a reason for it. Um, and so then when it comes down to like, okay, are we actually using all these techniques? It's a combination of we're trying to use the, uh, the, a combat system that we already have and, and improve it. We actually did try a shield wall prototype, um, but it was very, very hard for uh, players to understand how to function singularly in a collective unit. If you saw like you know 30 people this way with shields and you were one of them, what were you doing exactly? Were you pushing forward and making the wall bulge a little bit? Were you moving the entire wall? Were, you, were we kind of faking it so you had control over the entire wall? Were you responsible for everybody pulling their shield up or just yourself? Or, and could, could you not just break away from the wall and jump over it just to start you know, screwing everybody up? There's so many questions that go into designing new systems like this that um, we try things, but if you find that you're running out of time uh, as your prototype and you're just like, man, we're not getting close to this. We're not quite, we're not getting that feeling because it has to feel good and natural. So I think after the first year or a year and a half, we left the shield wall prototype behind, for instance. Um, and same with maybe some other things um, that you, as, a, as somebody who's really into this um, time period and this fighting technique would notice is missing or lacking. Um, uh, the idea is to kind of, in general, make a credible feeling, um, but without sacrificing uh, usability or and or you know busting our um, our schedule. I'll give you one more quick example. Uh, when we were making Assassin's Creed Four Black Flag, um, the last game I wrote, um, uh, well, I was the writer. I'm the narrative director on this. We have lots of writers on this game, um, but that was the last game I worked on before this one, and we were doing pirates and the golden age of piracy. And when you do the research, you find that pirates almost never got into fights. They didn't get into gunfights. They would brandish their swords and scare the crap out of people. And then most 99 times out of a hundred, the people would give up, they'd go below deck, they'd be tied up. People, they'd, you know, the pirates would steal their stuff and sail off. But we couldn't figure out how to make a game where you just scare people most of the time. We needed more of that swashbuckling feeling so we got you into fights and with British soldiers, not um, not civilians, because it wouldn't feel right having a cutlass and a pistol against a, a civilian who had a bucket, right? You need to fight somebody who's on equal ground, so you fight a soldier. So Assassin's Creed 4, Black Flag, you fight lots of soldiers, you get in lots of gunfights. Real pirates, not so much. And the same applies here. You're always finding these compromises you have to make for the sake of um, uh, you know, just you're not trying to hit realism. There are games out there that do realism very, very well, and it's a completely different experience. Um, but for our sake, we want this kind of more like adrenaline filled, um, punchy quality. Um, I think I made the joke with you last time, Jackson, where uh, the onion said, um, realistic World War II simulator simulates the feeling of unloading trucks and sitting in trenches. You know, which is like what most of war is like, just like seven days of sitting around and one hour of shooting. If, so if you were to recreate the ratio, ratio and the other, you'd be like, what, what is this? <laughs> that's, that's such a classic ending headline. Um, no, but that's, that's so well put. And it's also part of what I call that modern saga making, where you're not yeah, trying yeah. to recreate exactly the past or exactly the past literature. You're reinterpreting it, re-narrativizing it for the present. Elizabeth Jarvis uh, asks, what were some of the major historical inspirations, like major figures, events, general way of life, that led to the game's time period and the main focus in England uh, versus other areas the Norse were expanding into? 
Mm -hmm. um, well, as soon as this team picked um, the the Viking Age, you know, they had to narrow it down. Obviously, um, we are a, a series that just likes to ground everything in history as much as possible. At least start there and give some credible recreation of it. Um, quite unlike, let's say, the show Vikings, which is more like um, an, an, a broad overview of the Viking Age, right? The show Vikings takes two generations and cram, but, but then kind of applies that to 300 years of Viking history. Um, so it's more of like a, I don't want to say cliff notes because that's sort of derogatory, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a summary of the Viking Age. We wanted to just say, hey, we're in this period. So the Viking invasion of England, um, was really fruitful for us in a lot of ways. It helped create modern England. It has a lot of very well-known characters like Ivar, Halfdan, Uba, King Alfred, King Chaelwulf. Um, we even stuck Rolo into our game, Hrolfer, and uh, <clears throat> as a young man, so he's not going to, you know, make a name for himself until a little bit later. But we we stuck him in anyway, um, as a as a like he's like seventeen or sixteen. Um, and that just was a period that had a lot of really interesting conflicts. Um, we also wanted to set it in a time period where England was kind of half Norse, half Saxon, like the, the, the Norse had come in and already taken over a bunch of stuff. The most of the major conquests had been accomplished because um, we didn't want you to feel like um, a colonizer. We wanted you to feel like you were coming into something and the sort of the damage had been done and you're actually trying to more like settle alliances and, and almost keep the peace um, with some kind of uh, affinity for the Norse, obviously. But, but there are a lot of territory arcs where you're just working with Saxons and trying to sort of settle the problems in their area. Um, and as the game goes on, a huge thing about sort of the end act of our game is this idea that a lot of the arcs are not even about combat at all. One's about a wedding. One's about just a, a funeral, a reunion with an old friend, um, and and or finding a traitor in a, you know amongst a, a group of friends that you have. We're trying to move away from like a, a lot of the conquests have been done, and also there's this sense that King Alfred is he's kind of ready for you or even though you've kind of pushed him away for a moment he's gonna roar back so we leave you with this sort of feeling like maybe maybe the accomplishment that I made was just making this place safe for my people but I'm not gonna win the war I just won the couple battles um, and so and obviously in Norway too, King uh, Harold Fairhair um, we there I guess the, the 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 battle of what is it uh, Havers, Havers Fjord? what uh, yeah I didn't say it right um, there's a kind of a, a 28 year period in well in which people think it may have happened we picked the really early end of that timeline so that we could get Harold's consolidation of power in Norway into our game as well it's actually the inciting incident that that has uh, Sigurd and Eivor and Sigurd leave uh, Norway like. You know, England or Norway is getting too crowded, not enough room for this many kings. So you head to England. So that was also uh, very important. And I think that was a that was just the right amount. Um, it's the Dark Ages, so there's a lot of gaps in the historical record. Um, there's the the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. There's a couple sagas that allude to uh, events. There's some archaeological records and other documents. But really, it's a it's 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 the best. It's actually the best time period for us. It's got just enough to have some big figures, but without being feeling handcuffed to historical events like it, writing. Like I think I know the team that wrote Assassin's Creed Three had a really tough time because the the American Revolution is very very well documented. So trying to move around certain events and, and place events and finding out where their character fit in those events was was more difficult. And this team had a had an easier time. And, and then we would stretch things if we if we needed to as well. Like King um, uh, Herodri of of the Welsh, he is in our game. Um, he dies at a, about the right time, but not under the right uh, not under the same circumstances in in history. And I just put it down to um, his ancestors were so embarrassed how he actually died in our game that they changed it uh, to pretend like he died in a different battle. <laughs> Makes sense. I mean, it certainly makes sense with the internal logic. Yep. Um, yep. 
Now, uh, Elizabeth has also asked uh, flighting. Uh, the town events were a lot of fun. This is one I really enjoy imagining used to happen. Was flighting something that used to occur in real life outside of myths? Uh, are there flighting battles in the game that relate to or have Easter eggs um, to real myths or other real records from Norse times? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mentioned before there is the uh, the Odin uh, Thor flighting the the word battle. Um, <clears throat> The, the flightings were actually written initially by a writer, a writer Kim Belair. Um, we we had always wanted this idea of, of these poetry battles. It took us a little while to figure out how to do them in the right way. There were early, um, early um, uh, prototypes where we would have the character standing there and their, the environment they were in would tell something about their personality and that you had to actually be really observant and you had to pick out things about them and then find the right line to insult them. Like, so if some guy was like a fisherman, he would have like a fisherman's pole and a you know big basket of fish. And so you could be like, oh, he's a fisherman. So I'll, I'll talk about what a terrible fisherman he is. And that's, that'll really get him. Because if I pick the line where he's a bad hunter, he won't care because he's not actually a hunter. Uh, that one was too esoteric for people. I also, at the beginning, this is another example of always wanting to start with the research, but then deviating from it. I did a lot of research on my own and talked to Jackson about the actual form of um, Old Norse poetry and Anglo-Saxon poetry at the time. A lot of alliteration, uh, a lot of, um, you know, just a specific type of meter, alliteration and um you know, kennings and so forth. A lot of the, the poetic form has a very strict set of rules, but no rhyming. Um, and it turns out that rhyming is actually a very good indicator of, um, or it, it, it's, it's an easy way to match one line with another, right? It's, it's a gameplay element. So if, if I were to show you the word fox, ball, and, um, and eggplant, and then I give you the word rocks you would you would know how to pair those two fox and rocks um, so as a gameplay device rhyme is very helpful so what we ended up doing was saying uh, making a very easy um, uh, idea of flighting but it had to deviate from um, actual old norse and old anglo-saxon forms so we ended up writing uh, i think kim just wrote a bunch of stuff and i kind of just said Okay, you naturally write in anapestic tetrameter, so we're gonna so it's da 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 da. Um, so we're gonna write all of them in that, and she, then she took that, and so the idea is that there's always one right answer that has the right rhythm and it rhymes correctly. The other two, well, one will rhyme correctly but have the wrong rhythm, and one will rhyme incorrectly and possibly have the wrong rhythm or the right rhythm. In that way, having three choices it made it very easy to go, okay, if you just pay attention, you can find the right answer. We don't want people to lose these. We want people to have fun. Um, so you only lose if you're really not paying attention. And then there's about 15 of them. So we changed them up. So sometimes one of them is like, we're not gonna insult each other. We're gonna like flirt with one another. So you have to be really nice to me. And another one is a guy who, um, he doesn't care if you get it right or wrong. He just wants you to take another drink uh, you know, down another horn of mead. So by the end, you're just blindingly drunk and you actually can't lose uh, so long as you keep drinking. Another one is, uh, or the guy is so angry if you win that he wants to fight you. And so it turns into a brawl. And another one in, um, I think it's in Grantabridgeshire, modern day Cambridge. He's just so bad that Eivor is sitting there and he, and he starts slinging his poems and you're like, sorry, have we started yet? He's like, of course we've started. <laughs> Like, but he's so bad at poetry that it just doesn't sound like anything. And so you can't lose that one either. <laughs> so we had fun with all 15. Each one has their own kind of flavor to it. Um, so that's the, that's the long story of how flighting was created. <laughs> I just, well, I mean, I just, maybe, maybe you can actually, actually add. add. It's not called, it's not sliding called sliding sliding in old parts or, or old English. English. Right. Yeah, that's a modern, I think that's actually from early Scots is where that okay. term okay. comes from. Yeah. In Old Norse, it's usually called Senna. When people exchange like that, but you see it in sagas all the time. Eagle Saga is a great example. The Saga of Arrow Odd is a great example. And then you see it with gods, uh, for example, in Horror's Oath between Odin and Thor, like you were referring to. Uh, she had also asked whether there was anything I was consulted on that resulted in me recommending a change in something. I think the closest thing to that was probably the the name. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can let you talk about that if you want me to mute myself. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
So somehow, um, when we were coming up with the name, again, we were trying to find a name that was female, but could kind of sound male to most people's ears. Um, we actually, and we did a lot of research and we were looking, I, I have no idea what sources we were looking through, but we kept finding this one attestation and maybe it was because there was one wrong one and a bunch of other people copied that one. Um, but it was the name Yora, J-O-R-A, Yora, which also would look like Jorah, like Mormont from Game of Thrones. So we thought people would like, okay, cool. That's male, female, whatever. Um, we thought it meant uh, kingly. Um, which uh, was re very uh, appropriate for our purposes. Um, Eivor is somebody who's uh, not the chieftain of the clan, but is descended from somebody who is definitely a, ch a chief or a king. Um, so we wanted to kind of hint that Yora was very kingly. Uh, what it turns out when <laughs> Jackson got there, we gave him a presentation. He's just like, oh man, all this looks so beautiful. You guys have done your research. I just have one question. The name Yora, that means horse. And we're like, means horse? No, 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 look, here's our printouts of the research we've done, Jackson. And it turns out, I think what the problem was is that somebody used a, like a kenning or a metaphor to refer to a, a man as like the, the stallion of his clan or the, the, the main horse of his clan. I, I think that's kind of where the confusion came from. I think I found that reference somewhere. Uh, but it definitely meant horse. <laughs> and so we was like that, and we were literally four weeks away from our first audio recording with our two main characters. Um, so we, I remember me, the creative director and our writer, one of our writers, uh, we had this like um, triumvirate uh, where we got our together and we're like, okay, what, what are other things? Every other name we came up with, we ended up using in the game. So there's a character named Valdis. Um, uh, in East Anglia, that was that was our second runner-up for our main character's name, Valdis. Um, but Avor, we settled, we settled on, on, on Avor. And, 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 uh, I remember the morning after we first had this discussion. I'm still in Montreal, and I'm going to meet with you later. And I'm sitting there at breakfast, just writing this email with like 30 old Norse names yeah, yeah. and their meanings and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was kind of yeah. a fun yeah. process. And, and, and to, go, to, go to go back to what, back to what you heard. heard uh, uh, talked about earlier there is a male version that we that we could have used but we did not want to imply that the male version was also uh historically uh gr grounded in the ninth century um people who play our game to the end will understand oh, okay i get how they're doing it so we always had the the male version um on hand but we we ended up saying no we can't use it because that would be that would be weird for accuracy's sake, I'll, I'll say one last thing. When you do go to Vinland in our game, um, keep an eye out for a nice reference to Yora. Um, there's a character where, because Eivor doesn't want to be known for who she is, she goes and she steps off the boat and pretending to be a thrall, and she's there to work. And the person who's kind of welcoming people off the boat says, who are you? And she's like, Yora. He's like, what, what horse? And she just says, my, my father didn't want children. <laughs> and he goes, well, and then for the rest of the time, the character just calls you horse. <laughs> so that's a special tribute to Jackson. Thank this you. Thank a, you. <laughs> this is my true legacy in the game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's great. Chris, uh, <laughs> Christopher Eklund asks, a uh, question uh, primarily for me. We can both talk about this. I'm, I'm curious to hear any challenges you had while collaborating with the development of the game, if it appeared there were any difficult tasks and if you had to solve it by freehand. I mean, the name thing is maybe the closest thing, like, because, yeah, there was a really short kind of time window there and trying to help you all figure that out. Um, you know, otherwise, I think it was pretty smooth sailing. We always had a great channel of communication uh, between you and me and the other people that I worked with, too. Uh, yeah, you did, yeah, a, you lot did a lot of rude stuff, stuff after, after uh, uh, your initial visits. visits. Yeah, I had that whole Excel file. Yeah, yeah. That I went through with all the runes. Yeah. Can we, we talk about, about the challenges, challenges you, you, you faced with that? With that? Uh, I mean, you know, it's like you said when you when you when you have lots of people working together, it's it's an error such as it is more of enthusiasm than of anything else. But people are going to sort of throw in what they found here and there, and someone says, "Oh, I know this means this." I, I know this means this, and you know, often it doesn't. 
Um, so I try to be pretty consistent and apply a, a, a standard, um, you know, that Excel file I was sent with all these different runes in it. Um, I had like four responses. It was like, rune, but doesn't mean what you think. The other, you know, not even a rune doesn't mean what you think, <laughs> right? A rune does mean what you think. Chicken, chicken scratch. scratch. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, and I don't know exactly what the fates of all those different things were because there were like thousands of them. Um, yeah. yeah. But no, this has been, and, and I and I mean it, and I've said this in a few different interviews. This has absolutely been my best experience consulting with wow, yeah. wow, any media project. Maybe we should, Maybe we should make, a make a second, second game just to bring you back. back. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> did, did, there was there a was one, one job you had, you had which was um, uh, we wanted, we wanted every, every single map name, name translated, translated into runes. Was yeah. that right? Was that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, and I had to figure out, and I don't even remember how exactly we resolved this now because. We've been working on this for a year and a half, or I've been yeah. in this. You've been working on this for like five years. Uh, three, three, <laughs> three. Yeah, like whether it was going to be the old English names, it was going to go into the runes. Probably was going to like Norseify the old English name, yeah. name yeah. put that into runes, or is it going to be like how a Norse person would hear the old English name and then write that in runes? Yeah, that was that was tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like like, like Ibrahim, Ibrahim, Jorvik, right. York, York, for which, for which all this, all this like, like yeah. yeah. I think what I did. <laughs> this is again like a year and a half ago is i said is if there was a really well-known norse name like jorvik for york i used that <laughs> right otherwise i did like a norse hearing of the english name and it's always and it's always in younger, younger Puthark, Puthark, right? right yeah yeah because yeah, we yeah. decided we weren't going to use old english through yeah, yeah too because right, right. we didn't want to confuse <laughs> the issue yeah yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> Again, that's like a year and a half ago, which it's, you know, this is the end of 2020. That seems like 15 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's like, ah, oh, yes, I recall. Yeah. yeah. Um, a few more questions if you have time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. We had in, in the uh, in the list that was approved. Uh, Aaron Owing asks, um, asking uh, the, the you in this question is me. I took your class last year and you made a big point to say the Norns carved destiny as opposed to weaving it. As I've been playing the game, I constantly hear characters talking about threads of fate being woven. Why was the decision made to go with fate being woven over it being carved? Uh, and I can mute myself for you to talk. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually not sure. I think. I think. I, I think initially we just started using that metaphor. There is a couple of writers. The writer Pierre Boudreau. He he wrote the first drafts of the opening Norway arc and the Asgard arc. Uh, most of our writers, uh, so I had a team of a bunch of writers, and most of them got to write um, one and a half to two of the arcs. Some worked on a little bit more. And then I would do a kind of an edit pass on it to, to kind of pull everything together. But Pierre uh, started using this thread metaphor and weaving metaphor for because it, for poetic reasons, but also for kind of uh, the idea that... Um, um, I think it's right in the opening of uh, no, it's actually at the end of the Asgard. This idea that that um, fate can unravel, and um, that you're, if you're trying to change your destiny, you pull on a single thread and it can kind of all kind of come apart, or you can weave a new thread in. This idea and carving as a metaphor felt more static, right? Um, uh, I think I think that's it. It, it also like um, I I think I think even for me I. I in my head, it was always sort of interchangeable carving and weaving. And I probably just at some point made a decision in my mind and never looked back. I never really thought about that, like which one is like the more accurate one. Um, but as a metaphor, it worked. And as a visual, it worked. We have moments where you actually see the Nornir and they have these weird like coverings on their faces and sort of strange headdresses. And they have these big looms and there's blood dripping off of them. and and so I, and Jackson's going to come in with some some deep knowledge here. <laughs> but, so that's kind of uh, where that came from. But I, I I probably if I'm if we were wrong about that, I probably forgot that I was wrong, <laughs> like two years ago. And just you know how you as soon as you get an error, you just proceed with that error, and then just sort of like chaos and butterfly wings. It just it infects everything else. But um, but but yeah. also I think that thread metaphor is not unknown to them. Like it really yeah. doesn't yeah. bother me because it's kind of like how people talk. Even people who don't believe in ghosts, people I talk about this with afterlife beliefs today. People might believe in heaven and hell, but this will talk about their ghost in a kind of like literary sense almost. Yeah. Like I'm yeah. going to haunt you, 
or I feel like his spirit haunts this place. It doesn't necessarily mean they believe literally there's a ghost. In the same way, you do see that thread metaphor for fate in Old Norse literature. Even if they believe the fates are being carved by the Norns, they still can talk about it in a kind of literary way as being woven. And it actually works very well with that sense of, yeah, like it gets raveled or unraveled, right? Or this is already kind of yeah. woven yeah. in. You can't go back and redo it. There's a, there's a moment in, 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 in the early, early Norway, Norway after you see a, um, um, the prophecy and says, hey, you're going to betray your, bro your brother Sigurd. The Eivor says, no, Odin tried to fight against his fate. I think it can be done. And so it's about really like I'm gonna pull that I'm gonna pull that thread out of the main pattern. Yeah, I like I said, it it, it really doesn't bother me. Um, and then you also see uh, in the poem Darth the Oath and Yal Saga where the Valkyries weave the fates of men who die in battle. So it's not an unknown metaphor to them. It's just not what they picture the Norns doing. So you know, at, like to me, it's not a huge. It's never been a huge issue. Um, Robert Ray asked, how many stanzas of Havamal are hidden throughout the game? So far, the load screen has stanza 77 and runes in a circle. I did that. Uh, the world event, the dreamwalking warrior, Eivor says stanza 23. That may be a little yep, bit of a yep. spoiler. Uh, any others? Uh, 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 quite a few. Um, there's another moment where um, at the very end of the Oxenfordshire arc, so Oxford, Oxfordshire, uh, where um, where another passage is spoken. There's also these these kind of fun little side activities, these mushroom trips where you trip out on mushrooms and a, a weird sort of mystical puzzle appears before you and you and you um, you solve it. And I tried to find a have them all stanza that kind of related to the activity we're doing. It's kind of a stretch, but but uh, but Avor will sort of spontaneously compose a line from the have them all uh, there. Um, I, I actually, the very last thing that I wrote for the game is the very first thing that you hear, uh, which is um, adapted very loosely from uh, Jackson's uh, translation of the Poetic Edda. I had to rewrite it. Um, I just took the, the general sense. I actually read three different translations and pulled them all together, but Jackson's always has the most like really clear modern language, which is very nice. Um, but I, I rewrote um, a a very loose interpretation of the opening lines of the Voluspa um, uh, to talk about the world beginning. You know, you know, there was no sand, there was no sea, no light, no dark, or, you know, um, then fire met ice in the gasping void, and from that scream came the giant emir, stuff like that. I, I, you won't really recognize it as the Voluspa, but you'll recognize the images and stuff. Um, I, think I, I think in a lot of my edits and rewrites, I snuck in a lot of Havamal. I hope I think so. Keep your keep your eyes and ears open. Uh, they're there, um, but I love the love hobble. The hobble. Ball. It's 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 just one of the most fun things that um, actually Jackson introduced to us because it is when when you're dealing with old religions, you're always looking for the the human elements. Like the, the stories of the gods are fun, but you want you know words to live by, and that's why I think I'm not uh, particularly religious, um, but I really enjoy reading like Ecclesiastes. Um, and because it seems to have like a lot of practical wisdom. It's not about, you know, the, the, the tenets of a religion or whatever. And same thing with the Havamal. It's just a lot of practical wisdom. It gives you a window onto the human side of a, of a culture that's, you know, many hundreds of years gone now. Um, I like that aspect. And so I have my, I have my traveler's Havamal up at my desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love wisdom literature. Not that that's surprise anybody yeah, watch yeah. this um and then last question on our our pre-approved list uh matthew barclay asks uh as the raven clan uh comes from norway were there any changes made to the old norse dialogue to reflect differences between old Icelandic and old uh norwegian Ooh, i'm not sure i i don't think so yeah that would, I, I'm, not sure, I, I'm not sure i understand, understand the question well there's the uh, I've worked on a, a movie for uh, Grimfrost where they actually have Swedish Vikings who speak in specifically Old Swedish. Okay. Um, I think that's that's most of the context for this. Uh, but but since I didn't work on any of the spoken dialogue by anybody, I don't think there would be anything like that. No, and no, there's and very limited, limited Old Norse in our game. game. Uh, um, it, 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 we, we, we limited, limited to like, like a little, a little phrase, phrase or a word. Or, you know, 
Right. Uh, Trainer, um, the, 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 the thing, yeah, 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 yeah. The, 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 the thing we, we like to do is educate, educate through, through um, um, a more general, a more general feeling, feeling, and, 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 and then we'll sprinkle, sprinkle the, dialogue the dialogue with things, things like, like, uh, like, uh, like uh, a dr yeah, dringer or ergi or arger, you know, these kind of insults. Um, and so you'll see them and we'll often have them in the dialogue and then we'll put a parenthetical around them and define them the first like three, four times you hear them so that you get comfortable with it. And then, you know, they, they start, you know, they use it fairly frequently throughout the, the game. And by the end, you're going to be like, Dranger is my new favorite word. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I think my channel has like boosted the modern knowledge of that word by about 1% and this game yeah, is going to yeah. boost it by like 100%. <laughs> <laughs> but that's going to indirectly be me. So I, I take it's all, all down to you. I, I, I take something from that. Skull did ask, will we see Eivor in future Assassin's Creed games? We don't, we don't plan, plan that far ahead, far ahead in terms of, of like little, um, small little appearances. Um, we had just released this game. There's, of course, uh, you know, everyone's dreaming about the future, but we, uh, it's, if the past is any indication, other assassins have appeared in fun ways and other main characters, Eivor's not an assassin, but other characters have appeared in fun ways um, in future games. Um, it's always possible. The, the the science fiction nature of our series makes that possible. So there's actually Easter eggs uh, in our game from the Origins characters that a lot of people have found and they've really loved. So if you like uh, Bayek and Aya from Assassin's Creed Origins, you can find bits and pieces of them in our game. Uh, Jonathan Barrick asked, um, without minimizing the extent, uh, how involved was uh, Dr. Crawford with the game? Um, just how in-depth did his uh, involvement and uh, consultation get? Well, I'll answer that very briefly, and then you can you can also follow up on that. Um, we, uh, actually, I mean, we've been spying on Dr. Crawford for many years. <laughs> You know, he's got a, he's got a, I don't know if you know, but he's got a really great YouTube channel. Um, and, uh, and so as soon as we started this project, we were just watching all his videos. Um, we had a, a world director who's not, uh, he's moved on to a different uh, company now, but uh, Stefan, he kind of was always sending out um, Jackson's videos um, on different topics. And, and it was always in our mind from 2018 forward to like, can we just contact him directly get him over here so we were we were supping uh from his cup of knowledge uh for a year before we actually contacted him is that is that, is that bad metaphor uh i'm a writer <laughs> i should know better um and so i think we contacted you probably in the middle of 2019 and we set up a um an actual a day or two of of uh, of seminars and and so people who were all over the company were invited to come and just listen in on a bunch of seminars that he gave um and that was incredibly in, informative and people from all over uh, the montreal studio um came in and then from that point on he was i had his email address direct contact and we would just talk frequently um whenever i needed an answer to something that's that's from my side that's that's what i was doing he might have a, a perspective yeah, it was pretty open-ended, right? I mean, there was never, um, it, like, I was never really done. You know, previous times when I've consulted or whatever on a game or, or not, well, not really games, but like movies and TV shows, it's like there's like a thing they want and that's it, right? That's the kind of the end of the exchange. But this was always pretty open-ended and it's like, oh, hey, could you answer some questions about this? Uh, what do you think about that? Um, it really was more like, I don't know what I would think of when I think of the word consulting rather than just like, yeah, just one exchange of yeah, yeah. materials or whatever. It, it, but it's been great for me and, and the best relationship I've ever had with a media company. I'll say it again, because it's been fantastic. Yeah, uh, yeah it's fun. Uh, so another question uh, from Jonathan Barrick was, since the game takes place in various locations, do the ambient conversations reflect the actual languages spoken in the regions, Old English in England, Old Norse in Norway? I think you, we already kind of talked about this. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think uh, uh, that's, maybe that's something I'll have to. Um, if you, if you keep an eye on my Twitter, maybe I'll maybe I'll be able to find Nick Grimwood, track him down, ask him exactly what he did. But but I I have some feeling that he would have tried to recreate um, 
some kind of semblance of Old English and maybe um, used Icelandic or uh, for the crowd life dialogue. Um, we actually also did, uh, when you go to Vinland, we found, um, uh, we, we actually got back in contact with the, the, uh, uh, the Mohawk tribes that we uh, talked with for Assassin's Creed 3, and we actually fully voiced the entire, um, that entire section in Mohawk. And we don't even translate it. We wanted you to feel like you were a deep outsider. You know, there's this idea that Old Norse and Old English are somewhat mutually intelligible. And if you're careful, you can understand each other. But when you go to Vinland, absolutely not. Um, and there's uh, Eivor, actually, the first thing she says, like, do any of you understand Norse or Saxon? No? OK. And it's just like nothing. There's, so there's hand gestures, and they misunderstand each other. But all of it is absolutely real. Um, so you can actually translate all of that. They all have real conversations. There's even a moment at the end of the Vinland arc where um, one of the uh, Native Americans tells a story, a long story. It's an actual story from Mohawk culture that we consulted with. We had a, a writer from uh, a, a tribe near here um, actually write it down. And um, so if anyone out there speaks that language, you can translate the whole thing for, uh, for, uh, for the other fans. So we try to do as much as we can within the time that we have. Now that's cool. So yeah. Yeah. so in this game, you can get a little bit of Mohawk, just like on my channel, you can occasionally get random bits of Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course now, now the, the, this is 100 years ago, or 1,200 years ago, or 1,100 years ago, guaranteed that language would not have been the same back then, but we have absolutely no way of knowing, so we had to use what was, you know, available. But it's a really cool flavor thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, he also said that he would like to get, uh, same person Jonathan saying he'd like to get an update with me giving a side quest to Eivor and wishing her all the best. Uh, <laughs> that would be fun. Um, uh, Maeve, Jeff and Kate's admin, I don't know which name to cite for that asks, uh, what locations or landmarks in Norway inspired the scenery in the game? Um, <clears throat> I think w we did a kind of a, a compressed version of, of Norway. Uh, dramatically, we were all very impressed with the Lofoten Islands. Um, so we kind of brought them down a little bit. And then, and you know, Alrikstad, Stavanger, and, um, and those in towns like that. Um, uh, but, you, you know, the the more you zoom in, like Norway is like a fractal. So the more you zoom in, the more curves you find. So we just sort of zoomed out to a certain period point and, and kind of stuck with that. It, it, I think um, our Norway is kind of a greatest hits of Norway uh, because most of the game doesn't actually take place there. That's only about 5% of the game. Um, so we wanted the mood and the feeling and the dramatic aspect of the landscape of Norway in winter. Um, but um, England is actually where you'll find a, a more of a one-to-one -one correspondence. I mean, even that's not true, but what a favorite thing to do is people are like, oh, I found my little hometown and go to try to like run around, you know. Um, oh, or, you know, then they're disappointed when their town is missing. And, you know, so it's, it, it's never a one-to-one -one recreation. In Norway, even less so because um, we tried to just give that feeling uh, before you left Norway. So, um, but I think you can, I, I'll have, there's a guy, Eric Porowski, he was the lead, the kind of the conceptual design lead of, um, of the Norway region. Uh, he's on Twitter. Um, I think if you poked him, he could probably find, um, he could probably tell you a little bit how they approached uh, the, the, or the, what decisions they made to sort of recreate Norway. Eric Porowski, go bother him. Tell him I sent you. I sent you. <laughs> Cool. Kind, of, kind of reminds me of how Django Unchained is like greatest hits of the American West. Like it doesn't yeah. really make yeah. sense how they get from one place. Like it's like now you're in Wyoming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's probably, probably greatest hits of of of, of, of like, of like um, um, Sergio, Sergio Leone movies. movies. Yeah, actually, pretty much. <laughs> um, I have two more that came in late. Do you want to? Sure, yeah, sure, yeah. Two, two more. All right, you're being awesome to us. Um. So uh, Rachita on Patreon had asked, will Odin be presented as the wise god, speaking knowledge to humankind like in Hothmall, or the warmongering, uh, selfish figure mentioned in uh, other Norse texts? 
Ooh. I like that question. So I'm not going to get too much because to say too much would be spoilery. But when you're in the dream worlds, uh, we kind of went with about of a 70% um, asshole, 30% wise. And when you're in the, um, the world of England, we flip those ratios a little bit in terms of how Odin is perceived and, how, and, and the importance of Odin in people's lives. It's almost like the humans in 9th century uh, um, Norway or the Norse people of 9th century uh, in the 9th century, they kind of like um, spit shined Odin and they just like his wisdom and Eivor is always spitting Odin wisdom. Um, and so Odin is seen as a very, not benevolent figure, but, but a figure kind of one to emulate, you know, to some degree. But when you get to the dream world and uh, I'll say there's, there's moments of reflection in our game where Eivor is reflecting on a big decision that she has to make. And Odin will actually appear as a character to kind of like whisper into her ear, Hey, you should do this. In those moments, he's, he's the asshole version. He's the be selfish, seek glory, do things for yourself. And Eivor's like, yeah, but yeah, but what about my clan, my people, you know, like, you know, I gotta, you know, so it's kind of a devil on the shoulder thing. And that's why I say the fight club is, is a relevant example. Cause there's the Edward Norton character who's grounded and responsible. And, but then this Brad Pitt character is kind of pulling him, pulling on him. No, just, you know, be wild, get in fist fights, feel life. He, he's the romantic ideal. And, uh, and and Edward Norton's the Enlightenment ideal. Now that's I'm just I'm grasping here, but that's I made some point somewhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sad that I decided to watch the first hour and twenty minutes of Fight Club for the first time last night, and here you are spoiling it before I can finish it tonight. Um, so, all right. So for your last question, then uh, Rashida had also asked on Patreon, will we see any? recognizable characters from the sagas of the Eisners in the game, like Egil from Egil Saga or oh, Egil from Nail Saga? Uh, no, but um, this is fun. Um, so if you if you guys are fans of uh, the band Wardruna, and you know um, Einar Sel Selvik, is that his name? His last name? Um, and I've seen you hang out with him. And, uh, um, so you know him well. He actually stars in our game. He wrote a lot of uh, songs for our game. He also stars in our game as a kind of a, um, a, a a boat scald. He's always on the boat, but he'll sing songs and he'll tell stories. And we call him Braggy. He tells stories that are drawn directly from the sagas. So you won't meet anyone from the sagas directly, but you will hear stories about um, Egil. You'll hear stories about... Uh, Jackson's always amused when I talk about uh, sarcastic Halley. We tell stories about him. So you get the kind of impression that they, they lived around and they were around at the time, but I don't believe that we have anyone directly from the sagas. Um, no. That's so great. I, Einar is a really great guy. It was just his birthday. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's yeah. had a big yeah, year okay. with the new album. Too. Oh, they, oh, they, they did such fantastic, fantastic work with the, with the soundtrack, soundtrack on, this, on, this on this game. You know, in 2019, the only show they did was uh, one right here at uh, Red Rocks. Wow. And, wow. Uh, I'm now officially the least cool person to ever be backstage at Red Rocks. <laughs> <laughs> well, Darby, your time has been uh, just... I know your time is precious, and we really appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions. I'm, I'm actually going to go on vacation, vacation right after this. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, have a great vacation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and thank you, Patreon. And, uh, well, for now, we'll have to wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the first question we had submitted was by Lara Kimmer. Uh, what sagas were the most inspirational when it came to writing Assassin's Creed Valhalla? It seems like the story is similar to a saga in terms of structure. Was it difficult to adapt game writing, let alone an Assassin's Creed game, to that structure? Yes. yes. So, so uh, the, the, um, the big, big saga, saga after came, came into our, our studio, the big, big saga, saga that um, I, looked I looked at, at the Saga, saga. Um, it was, it was it's, um, it's, um, 
not, not, not specifically, specifically for its structure, but for uh, how it presented its characters um, and, and the, the sort of themes, themes that ran, that ran through, through uh, the saga, the saga. Yeah, themes, uh, themes like, like honor, honor reputation. You know, you know, Egil has, has a whole sort of family, family thing that, that, that follows, follows him, him you know, through his, through his life, life, and he's always trying to, to rectify that. that. And it goes and all the way back to his grandfather. So we like that idea of a family lineage being sort of Tainted, tainted by a little dishonor, dishonor or a, a, a misunderstanding, misunderstanding and sort of carrying, carrying through, through, through generations. generations. Um, also, also the, um, I think, I think sort, sort of Jim probably, probably presented, presented it to us when he was giving, giving his lecture, but it didn't really, it didn't really hit home until, until I read it. Saga, saga that this, this really, really nice mix of, of being a warrior and a poet. Um, comes, across comes across in a really, in a really fun, fun way in Ego Saga. Saga. He's, he's not, not, he's not a guy you would expect in any, in any modern, modern film, film or anything, or anything to, to be any, any kind of poet. poet. He's, he's cranky, cranky and ornery and, 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 and has, he has imperial moods. And yet, and yet he, he can sling some, some really, really good poetry. poetry. And, and, and so I, 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 there's, 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 there was a moment when I was just reading it. Okay, our character, Abel, she's going to be a poet as well. Um and just, and just the sort of the sort of pieces, pieces that the sagas are known to, to, to whether it's like, you know, you know a meat hall, meat hall brawls, um, people, um, people throwing up in each other's faces, or, or you know, um, quick, quick and dirty raids, or these battles, battles of honor, honor that you know, you know happen explode, explode very quickly. quickly. All those, All those we, wanted we wanted to make sure that those these kind of set pieces made it into to our game. That was like a four part question. So I'll try to get it. So yeah, so the second part it was about writing for games. So um, games are very notoriously tricky uh, to write for um, any kind of extended story because for for a lot of reasons. One is the participatory element of the story. You want the player to get in there and feel like participating in the story, but games often don't have as many sort of uh, ways of expressing themselves through gameplay as stories tend to have. Um, you know, there so. You end up splitting the story between what the player can participate in, and then when you get past that, then you have like a dramatic scene that you write. Um, so if you want two characters to fall in love, you tend to do that in a scene because there's no like button to fall in love, right? What would that even mean? The buttons are for fighting and sailing and parkouring over obstacles, things. And you try to build the action set pieces around that. And then when you try to dovetail very nicely into the all the rest. Where the overlap comes from is, um, well, for this game in particular, we knew we wanted a long game. We wanted a game where you explored all of England. Um, and a lot of RPG games fall apart under the weight of trying to extend a single dramatic story for 40, 50, 60 hours. There often is a lot of um, downtime. Um, what we decided we wanted to do is take a little bit of a risk and say, rather than having one long story that goes through it, there is a kind of a through line, but we, we wanted to actually make this game more episodic. Um, before I'd read the sagas, which have an episodic feeling, um, I was using something like Don Quixote as a model, where Don Quixote has a series of characters. And those characters, I, I don't know that I'd even say that Don Quixote has a character arc. Um, he just has a temperament, and you sort of see that temperament sort of hit into every other character and change their lives in weird ways. It's actually very oddly similar to like um, Raymond Chandler novels. Philip Marlowe is a detective that never changes either, but everyone else around him changes. So we had this idea of having a character who has a strict set of, you know, very typically Norse uh, attitudes, um, but that you would get involved in, in, you know, one and a half dozen smaller territory arcs that have a full sort of five act structure that all feed into a much larger picture. And so what it means is that for people who are really into plot-driven games, our game's probably not for you. Or I mean, you'll have fun playing it, but you might find the story stops and starts more often. But for people who are into character-driven dramas, um, like, a, like, a, like the show Deadwood or something, where there's not a, 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 a hard-driving plot, but it's all about building up characters and just seeing where they go. That's kind of where we were headed. And then once we read the sagas, uh, especially Egil's saga, and noticing that his life just seems to jump into these sort of smaller episodes. He's fighting with King Ethelstan, Eth Ethelstan? Uh, um, Alfred's, uh, Alfred's grandson. Um, yeah, Ethelstan, because Guthrum was also Ethelstan. And, um, and, you know, 
uh, Egil's doing that, and then he's back in Iceland, and then he's back in Norway, and and it just has this more episodic feel where you, it's not leading to anything, any grand epiphany, where he suddenly realizes that the meaning of life is um, is you know being a mead brewer. Um, it, it's just a, a, a culmination of of actions. Um, I'm trying to think of the F. Scott Fitzgerald quote about personality being a series of um, do you know it? I don't know. <laughs> There's, it's right in the beginning of, uh, of The Great Gatsby, but it's a, yeah, personality is a series of successful gestures. That's kind of like, <laughs> that's kind of like what, what, uh, you know, Eivor is or what Egil is. It's just, it's a, it's a, a record of their personalities. So for us, it really was fun to break the game up into a series of 1620 territory arcs that every so often you come back to the, the the more emotional story of Eivor and her brother Sigurd, but it really is a picaresque of a game, um, and a lot of people really love that. Other people I found have kind of like, Ugh, no, it moves too slowly. But we took a risk, and I'm really happy we did because it, it's something kind of new and interesting. Um, so yeah, I think I missed probably some questions, some some nuances of the question, but uh, yeah. yeah. I thought that was pretty great. If I can come back, <laughs> I, so I, but a couple things occurred to me there. One is um, uh, I need to take like acting lessons or something so I can convey things through my face. Um, <laughs> another is I really like Deadwood. That's a great comparison. But another thing is uh, you know the myths are much like that, where the characters mm -hmm. are very consistent, but there's not often like one consistent narrative arc that connects right, right. connects them. So that's kind of an interesting uh, consistency there. And I love the Don Quixote comparison too. Mm -hmm.